Hi, I'm Rick McGuire. I'm the executive editor of CardioSource World News, and I'm with Dr. Robert Jones, Duke University. Revascularization, it can be a challenge sometimes, back to the drawing board for people with uh, diabetes. Diabetes puts all cardiovascular disease on a fast track. What is it about revascularization that makes it particularly challenging? Well, it was really a finding in the Berry trial, the bypass angioplasty revascularization investigation, which had to be stopped actually a little prematurely because as the Data Safety Monitoring Board looked at the data, the patients who got uh, uh, angioplasty, plain bare angioplasty in those days, um, uh, actually were, uh, had a little higher mortality than the surgical population, those who were getting revascularization. And so it was a safety issue, and they uh, uh, had us uh, complete the trial a little bit uh, early. And then in looking back, that uh, finding was uh, a, a little bit uh, unusual because it hasn't been replicated in a number of other uh, registry studies. So you want to give the patients options, but in the case of a diabetic, you maybe should push them a little bit more towards the idea of revascularization via surgery might be a better approach? Uh, that's what a kind of a simplistic look at that data would suggest. As we now have had more time to look back uh, calmly, what we understand is that that group of diabetic patients were different in many other ways. They had more advanced uh, coronary disease, and it was really the angioplasty physicians in those days who had quite a, uh, shall we say, uh, early way of recognizing patients who should have been sent to surgery and perhaps uh, were not really sending some of the patients they, they should have uh, sent to surgery and put in the trial to be randomized to surgery. And it was because primarily of this uh, severity of extensiveness of coronary disease associated with diabetes uh, that made the angioplasty techniques, which were pretty primitive in those days compared to what we can do today, uh, ineffective in those patients compared to surgery. So it's the standard look at the patient individually and ex how extensive their disease is before you make a decision. Well, of course, one patient can't tell us much, can it? So what we have to do is exactly what you said. Every patient we see in the future needs to have certain key baseline descriptors of information tabulated, and then we need to follow that patient just as we're caring for the patient, make sure that that record follows that patient for the rest of his life, and here in the ACC, along with the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, who already has their surgical database, we're beginning to put those two databases together. And we can build an individual patient-based data set for our population that will greatly help us as physicians in making the right decisions and in applying the randomized trial data that we do need. And there will be times where we need randomized trial data where we make these very important choices. Do I go to medical therapy or surgical therapy? Do I have angioplasty? Do I have surgery? And uh, so these trials are very, very important, but they must be placed in context. Are there specific factors for specific patients that you look for that will tip you one way or the other? Yes, and uh, right now, of course, the main thing is the extensiveness of coronary artery disease. That is what has permeated all of these trials uh, from the very earliest trials that showed if you have a left main stenosis, those patients do better than uh, with surgery than medicine. And then when angioplasty came along, it was uh, for the early angioplasty, the more simple forms of coronary disease uh, that this non-invasive technique was very well uh, suited for and uh, really was uh, uh, sometimes fought by the surgeons uh, because they were not understanding that uh, it was less invasive and did have some benefit. So we need to be careful that we as providers don't get into these turf wars where we are trying to protect kind of our way of doing things, uh, but that we are really focused as all providers should be on the care of the patient. Uh, the patient really should have access to the best information we have, and if the best information is we need to refer them to someone else to do a different kind of procedure for this condition, then we should do that. And I think we're realizing that as a profession, and there are uh, signs that the uh, surgeons and the cardiologists are increasingly becoming cardiovascular specialists and looking at each other as colleagues and not as uh, competitors for a patient.
And I think in 2011 here at the ACC meeting, they were talking about the fact that if you have cardiovascular disease in more than one bed, if you've got peripheral artery disease as well as, as heart disease, that also raises your risk. It does. And uh, there are, uh, uh, say, 8 to 12 major variables that always come out in any kind of multivariable models that we do. So it is really not rocket science anymore to uh, try to figure out what we should be capturing in the way of information. And then there are, of course, always gray zones. And that, when we have gray zones identified, that's where the randomized trials need to be conducted. And then we can generalize those by uh, uh, also doing registries right. and just validate that what we thought we found is really accurate. Dr. Robert Jones from Duke University. He, Dr. Jones is going to stick around. We're going to talk about some other things regarding clinical trials and participation and such. And uh, look for that at CardioSource World News. I'm Rick McGuire.